Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of the call. To ask a question during that time, please press star followed by number one. Today's conference is being recorded. Any objections may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn over the conference to Josh Finch. You may begin. Good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for joining us for the pre-launch news conference for Northrop Grumman's 19th cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station for NASA. Mission teams just completed the launch readiness review for the mission and are here to talk more about that review and the status of the launch. I am pleased to be joined today by Joel Montabano, Program Manager for NASA's International Space Station Program, Steve Krein, Vice President, Civil and Commercial Space at Northrop Grumman, Kurt Eberly, Director, Space Launch Programs at Northrop Grumman, Heidi Paris, Associate Program Scientist for the International Space Station Program, and Jeff Reddish, Range Chief at NASA Wallace. We'll hear from each speaker, and then after each speaker, we'll turn it over to question and answers. And first, we'll begin with Joel Montabano. Joel. All right. Thank you, Josh, and thank you guys for joining us today. You know, it's always exciting to be counting down for a launch, and as Josh said this afternoon, we just finished the launch readiness review, and at the end of that review, everyone pulled go for launch. Uh, this vehicle will deliver over 8,000 pounds of cargo, broken up into just over 2,400 pounds of utilization and research hardware, over 2,000 pounds of systems hardware, and over 3,500 pounds of crew support equipment that we'll use for spacewalks, as well as it has food and other consumables for the crew. Uh, the launch time is set for 8.31 Eastern time, Tuesday evening. That sets us up for a capture early Friday morning, uh, around 6 a.m., and we'll be uh, capturing and berthing to the Node 1 Earth-facing port. Uh, it'll take us about four hours to go from capture to berth, and then another three hours for the reconfiguration and leak checks for the vehicle. Um, and so about seven hours from capture to hatch opening. Uh, this vehicle stayed berthed for about three months, uh, and when we get closer to three months, we'll look at the, what dynamic activities are going uh, happening on board the International Space Station. We'll see how much trash we're able to put in the vehicle, and then we'll uh, narrow down an unburnt date. But you can generally plan for about three months. Uh, the Northrop Grumman team has been really good partners with the International Space Station program, and we're excited for this Cygnus, and we're excited for future Cygnus spacecrafts coming to the International Space Station. You know, looking forward, upcoming activities on board the International Space Station. We have a Russian spacewalk scheduled for August 9th, uh, the Crew-7 launch that we talked last week, uh, still looking in the mid-August time frame. A Russian Progress launch on August 23rd. And then a Soyuz launch in mid-September. And then we'll be returning the Soyuz that launched earlier this year and its crew in late September. Um, just a huge thanks to Northrop Grumman team, Virginia Space, my ISS colleagues, the Wallops team, our international partners, and everyone involved and preparing the Cygnus spacecraft for launch and for berthing. So thank you again, and with that, I'll hand over to Steve. Yeah, thanks, Joel, and it's, uh, it's great to see you again, and great to be back here at Wallops. And behalf of, on behalf of Northrop Grumman, I'd just like to add our, our welcome to the NG-19 launch. Uh, thanks to the mission partners, NASA, Virginia Space, uh, the Wallops Flight Facility team, and I'll just say that the teamwork and collaboration on these missions is exemplary and, and the finest I've seen in the industry, so really great teamwork and great uh, esprit de corps. Also, a very special thank you to the uh, Northrop Grumman team that's worked so hard on the mission, and a sincere appreciation to the team that's working these final hours and the preps for Tuesday evening's launch and successful mission execution thereafter. Uh, you know, it's been 10 years of Cygnus mission, and, and 2023 is really a special milestone. 10 years of really providing one of the world's most complicated delivery services with essential supplies, experiments, and equipment to the International Space Station. You know, back on the first launch in September 18th of 2013, the Orbit D-1 mission, we carried 1,300 pounds of cargo with 18 cubic meters of, of cargo and, and uh, trash disposal volume. Uh, for the mission on Tuesday, we now have over 8,200 pounds of mission capability, 27 cubic meters of cargo volume, soon to be upgraded to 36 cubic meters. Also, late load capability for special equipment, science needs, secondary missions, and now ISS reboost capability as well. So really just a continued investment from Northrop Grumman in collaboration with our, our partners and the best customer we have at, at NASA with Joel and the JSC team. We, we are incredibly proud of Northrop Grumman uh, to be among the, the NASA's uh, trusted mission partners 
uh, over this period that we just talked about, 10 years, we've carried approximately 130,000 pounds of critical cargo and hauled away about 91,000 pounds of waste thereafter. As Joel mentioned, we completed all certification and launch readiness reviews, and we're go for launch on Tuesday evening. A nice sunset viewing opportunity for the, the, the folks out there. Uh, the NG-19 launch vehicle is going to fly the same optimized mass configuration as NG-18. We've taken away all the peripheral and secondary structural elements to allow the maximum cargo load. And again, we'll be delivering about 8,262 pounds of science instruments, critical supplies, and equipment. Uh, you're going you're to hear all about the, uh, the great experiments in science capability from Heidi, so I won't steal the thunder there, but I'm really excited to hear about the memory card from the students around the world, which is really my favorite experiment that's going to fly. Also for the NG-19 mission, we'll fly the sixth and final spacecraft fire safety experiment, or SAFIRE. That enables scientists to continue studying the way the fire behaves in microgravity to improve the safety of future astronauts. Also, we'll do operational reboost or attitude raising uh, based on the NASA mission requirements. And finally, we'll take out the trash at the end with the mission disposal capability we have for any, uh, any garbage on board the, uh, the space station. Uh, as we get forward, uh, looking forward to the 24-hour launch window prior to, uh, to Tuesday's launch, we'll soon be fully immersed in the late load cargo operations, and that'll provide us to load time-sensitive materials and experiments and also provide the astronauts with perishable foods such as fresh fruit and ice cream. You'll hear from Kurt in just a moment about the interior's launch vehicle, but uh, Kurt and I are just incredibly proud of the team that's really pulled the mission together, and uh, it should be relatively straightforward. Joel, Joel talked in general about the uh, launch timeline, but, but after the launch, it's about a nine minute, so we separate from the interior's upper stage. Silvery deployment is scheduled to begin about 10.49 p.m., about two hours after launch. It's about a 30 minute uh, operation to get both the rays out. Uh, following day, we'll form a series of thruster burns to raise the orbit to approximately four kilometers below the space station. And the day after that, on the August 3rd, uh, Cygnus will begin its final series of thruster burns to raise the orbit to the capture point 30 meters below the station. At 5.54 a.m. on the 4th, the astronaut crew will capture Cygnus and will be a uh, Canada arm and uh, begin the birthing process. With, uh, and then we'll do ingress about eight hours later at August 4th at 1.46 p.m. ET. So an exciting mission coming up. I, you know, finally, I'd just like to, uh, to spend just a couple moments here. I know it's really, it's been a tradition at Northrop Grumman over the past 10 years of mission success to, to name each vehicle after a pioneer that's played a significant role in human space flight and exploration. And we're just incredibly honored to name NG-19 for Dr. Laurel Clark, an accomplished NASA astronaut, medical doctor, U.S. Navy captain, and space shuttle mission specialist. During her military career, Dr. Clark worked as a radiation health officer, undersea medical officer, naval submarine medical officer, diving medical officer, and naval flight surgeon. Laura was a passionate contributor to the space flight, uh, improving our space flight understanding of effects on the human body, and as a crew member and mission specialist aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia for the STS-107 mission. Launching in January of 2003, STS-107 was her first and only flight logging nearly 16 days in space. The crew worked 24 hours a day in alternating shifts during the mission and successfully conducted 80 experiments, including testing uh, to advance the bioscience knowledge of plant growth in space. Tragically, all seven crew members perished during the entry, and at just 41 years of age at the time of her death, Laurel had already achieved so much, and she continues to inspire future generations of explorers. Dr. Clark was awarded the Congressional Space Medal of Honor, and she's a true American hero. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Kurt to talk about the rest of the mission, but we are just incredibly proud and honored and excited for tomorrow's mission. So, Kurt, over to you, sir. Thanks, Steve. Okay, I'm going to talk about Antares, and uh, before I do, I'd just like to, to thank the Wallops Range folks and the Virginia Space Spaceport partners uh, for all the support they provide to us. Uh, it's very, it's very challenging to keep this quantity of complicated hardware working next to a salt ocean, saltwater ocean, and they do a great job. And so we really have a great partnership between the range, the spaceport team provided by Virginia Space, and then our Northrop Grumman resident team here at Wallops. Uh, we also get great support from the local community. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to be here during the summer. There's lots of other people here during the summer we shouldn't normally see, but uh, but we're able to get great support uh, in terms of logistics and everything else. We get uh, catering and everything else from the local community. So we're, it's, really, it's really great to be back launching Antares. 
All right, with regard to NG19, we had a, a dress rehearsal this past Thursday uh, with green cards where our launch conductors torture our launch team with off nominal scenarios, and I think that went really well. We rolled out to the pad on Friday. Uh, as everyone's aware, we had, uh, we had pretty high heat index Friday and Saturday, so we took some really special precautions to keep everyone safe, and that, that worked really well uh, for Friday and Saturday. We went vertical Friday night. On, on Saturday, we did our combined systems test. That's where we turn on all the systems uh, of the rocket and, and verify all the interfaces to the launch pad and launch range, and that all checked out well. Saturday night, uh, just last night, we rotated back down to horizontal, and we put the clean room over the front of the rocket and took the pop top of the fairing off to enable the final cargo load. And I understand that, uh, that there was a little bit of cargo load uh, accomplished this morning, but the main uh, final cargo load will happen 24 hours before liftoff, so that'll be uh, Monday evening starting around uh, 8.30 p.m. Uh, so, so from that time frame on, we'll start that uh, Monday evening. We'll then, uh, Cygnus will complete that and then close the hatch. We will put the the pop top back on the fairing and go vertical overnight. Uh, we'll probably be uh, back vertical by 8 a.m. Uh, final arming should be completed by 1 p.m. We will pick up the count at L minus five hours, so that's 3.30 p.m. local time. And uh, we'll go through our, our checkouts and start, uh, start getting the uh, propellant conditioning done at the pad. We start, <clears throat> we start propellant loading about an hour before launch. Uh, L0 time is when we ignite the engines and we do uh, we ignite them to an interim power setting. We do a health check at about 2.5 seconds after L0. If that passes, we throttle up to 100%. We release the hold down mechanisms and we retract the, pe the tail all, all simultaneously. Uh, then it's a quick nine-minute ride for Cygnus to orbit. Uh, we plan to inject them at uh, around 165 by 310 kilometer uh, orbit. And, and they'll take over from there uh, with the rendezvous that Steve described. I just want to take a note, a minute to note that uh, this is the last of the 230 plus configuration of Antares. And uh, last, you know, last year we announced uh, our partnership with Firefly Aerospace to develop the Antares 330, which is going to feature a new stage, a new first stage, and the existing upper stack. And that'll get us back flying here. Uh, in the 2025, summer 2025. Um, recent progress on that front, uh, we had a CDR on the engines and the structures of that first stage, and then we'll have an A330 system CDR in September, so just uh, next month. Uh, and then Firefly is planning to uh, get the, uh, their new Miranda engine on a test stand for a hot fire this fall, and they're actually, they've built a new test stand to, uh, to accommodate that bigger engine. Uh, I do want to thank uh, our, uh, our partners on the 230 Plus, Yuzhno and Yuzhmash of Ukraine and Energomash of Russia. This is the last launch uh, for, that, uh, for that foreign hardware. They've been great partners, and it's been a very successful configuration for us and flown uh, all the Cirrus 2 missions uh, since NG-12. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to Heidi. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining into the telecon today. I get the, uh, the privilege of sharing a bit about some of the science that's launching on NG19. Um, and I'll also talk a bit about our overall research program on the International Space Station. The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art orbiting laboratory. And it enables scientists from around the world to um, really redefine the boundaries of their discipline by imagining what might be possible if you could take gravity out of the equation. It provides researchers with access to specialized lab facilities um, where they have the ability to perform research in every major scientific discipline in an extremely unique environment. Research on the International Space Station is all about seeking advancements that make our lives better on Earth and also help us to explore further into space. It's about um, biology research, helping us to identify and test new therapies and treatment options. It's about physical sciences research that translates to um, improved products on a grocery store shelf. It's uh, demonstrating the new technologies that are needed to explore further into space and then repurposing those applications to improve our everyday technologies. Uh, it's gaining insight into how our planet's ecosystem is changing at a, a macroscopic level. 
And it's astronauts on orbit connecting with K through 12 students to inspire that next generation of scientists and explorers. The promise of the International Space Station is to do amazing things for the people of Earth. And that goal resonates deeply within our community of researchers who are using the International Space Station every day to uncover new insights. And it's also um, really an invitation for the broader scientific community um, to engage with us about the opportunities available to advance your research in perhaps one of the most unique science laboratories in the universe. So the, research, uh, the new research and technology demonstrations that are launching on NG19 are hoping to unlock insights in a variety of different areas. We have several investigations that will be studying advanced materials including uh, semiconductor crystals and graphene aerogels in order to characterize our ability to produce superior materials, not only on Earth, but potentially in microgravity in the future. For another investigation called ISS External Microorganisms, the crew will be collecting samples outside of the space station to help researchers understand whether the microorganisms, microorganisms that are vented from inside of the ISS are surviving outside on its external surfaces. This is vital information that may drive the design of future Mars-bound crewed spacecraft um, in order to make sure that we aren't inadvertently contaminating another planet with Earth-based life. We have an investigation called Neuronics uh, from a team that is brand new to spaceflight research. They're going to be looking to form 3D cell cultures of the human central nervous system uh, that can be used to test neuron-specific gene therapies for paralysis and also for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. The, uh, the next generation potable water dispenser called Exploration PWD um, will also be launching on NG19. It's going to test out the new technologies needed to support the crew on future long duration space flight missions. Um, we have an investigation called uh, Multi-Needle Longmore Probe. It's going to be helping researchers to understand the plasma environment around the ISS, which has uh, potential applications in the characterization and the prediction of the impacts that the ionosphere has on satellite signals. Um, this slide is also going beyond the purely technical with an investigation called iSpace Essay. Um, this involves more than 13,000 students from 74 schools around the world who teamed up to create and send uh, messages of hope and of perseverance on a memory card to the International Space Station. Um, and as Steve mentioned, we have the, the last act of science for NG19 uh, will be the sixth and final SAFIRE investigation. It's going to operate inside of NG19 after it's departed from ISS, and it is specifically studying how different oxygen levels affect spacecraft flammability. So these are um, just a few of the several dozen investigations that are launching on NG19. Um, I'd encourage you to follow, uh, follow along with us at ISS underscore research on Twitter. Um, for up-to-date information on the status of these and other scientific studies being performed on the space station. Um, and lastly, this is uh, shaping up to be a really great week for science, uh, for ISS science. Um, in addition to the launch this week, uh, we have another activity happening on the other side of the country. Uh, it's called the ISS R&D Conference. That uh, kicks off tomorrow in Seattle. And this is just a great opportunity for um, the ISS research community to come together, um, discuss recent uh, research and, and results that have just come out, and really to brainstorm about how to make the most effective use of ISS as a research platform through the end of its lifetime. All right, um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thanks, Heidi. <clears throat> Well, good afternoon. Jeff Reddish reporting from the God's country of the eastern shore of Virginia. Uh, happy to be here. Very excited for this launch. Um, first off, I'd like to, to tell Joe what a great honor it is to always support the International Space Station. That, that is just uh, above, above excitement when we can support our own, um, our own missions here at, at the Wallace Flight Facility. And as well, uh, Northrop Grumman and, and Virginia Space are consummate uh, professionals and experts at what they do. It's always a pleasure working with, with Northrop Grumman. So with that said, let's get on. We're very busy here at Wallops. Uh, we've been doing end-to-end -end testings between our Bermuda site in, in Bermuda and, and Wallops. Um, all end-to-end -end testing was completed today. 
We had multiple end-to-end -end tests throughout the last couple of weeks. Everything successful there. Uh, good news. Uh, the combined systems test, which Kurt has alluded to earlier in his, his talk, um, we completed that yesterday. Um, that's the first time the range really gets a good look at the vehicle. Everything went very well for, for that. Um, it was a combined systems test. So coming out of the range, we all are tracking telemetry and command systems are certified and ready for launch. We did experience a radar issue yesterday in the, in the um, combined systems test, but we've replaced that radar. And in addition, we're continuing to work on our radar to get it back up. So with respect to that, um, we have three radars going into the mission, which was, was uh, the configuration as we started. We could potentially have four if we do get our, um, our broken radar back up. It looks very promising that we'll have that ready for launch as well. Um, all configuration is frozen on instrumentation now. We, we've got a configura configuration freeze in place. Uh, no dig restrictions are here. And tomorrow will actually be a down day for the range as we reset our clocks and our work hour clocks so that we can uh, support the mission if indeed we have to go into some backup days. Now, when Tuesday rolls around, it looks like we'll be on console somewhere around 11. We'll start coming in on console somewhere around 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, and we'll funnel in through uh, until the 8.30 p.m. launch time. So between 11.30 and, and um, somewhere around 3 o'clock, we'll all be, be on console and, and uh, supporting that, that launch time. Weather-wise, um, from our uh, meteorologist, looks good for Monday. Uh, we have a probability of violation on Monday of 20%. I always like to reverse that and say probability of success of uh, at least 80% on Monday. Uh, looking into the second day, the probability even gets better. We have a probability of success of 85% on Tuesday or, or on Wednesday. And then lastly, if we have to go into the third day, there's a 30%. It looks like um, we may be a, a little less um, successful on that following day. But most of this, um, most of this, these violations are due to cumulus clouds and uh, uh, lightning trigger uh, uh, restrictions. So um, from that standpoint, there may be pop-up showers, pop-up thunderstorms, which are very, very common here in the area, especially with the high humidities. But all in all, everything looks great for the next three days, uh, starting Tuesday for for launch. And I think that concludes what I have to say for the day. Uh, the range is go for launch and go NG-19. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers for those opening remarks. And we'll now turn it over to questions. Remember, you can press star 1 to get into the queue. And you can also ask questions on social with using the hashtag AskNASA. And our first question in the queue will go to Jeff Faust at Space News. Hey, good afternoon. A question for uh, Steve. Uh, what was the root cause of the failed solar array deployment on the previous Cygnus mission? And what changes have you made to either Cygnus and or Antares to prevent that from happening on NG-19? Thanks. Yeah, he, he, uh, thanks for the question, Jeff and Steve. Actually, uh, both arrays were, were functioning well. The, the root of the issue uh, and why the, um, the one array did not deploy on, not deploy on NG-18 was that we had some debris, some fog that actually lodged into the hinge of the uh, the array, preventing the uh, deployment. So we've we've looked at uh, that. We've uh, identified a definitive root cause, and hence there's really no um, uh, redesign or or modifications required going forward. It was really an issue just based on the anomaly we had and the debris in the hinge. And our next question is from Marcia Smith at SpacePolicyOnline.com. Thanks so much. I guess this is to Joel and Steve and Kurt all together. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit in more detail about what reboosts you're planning. And Joel, can you give us any update on NASA's plans to build a space tug? Do you need to wait for your fiscal 24 appropriations before you move forward on that? And I'm wondering if Northrop Grumman is planning to put in a bid for that if it goes forward uh, with Cygnus as sort of the model for it. Okay. Well, this is Joel. I'll start, and then uh, other folks can, can answer. Uh, we're planning to do a 1.5 meter per second reboost with this Cygnus spacecraft. Um, the plan is to get this done before the September Soyuz gets docked to the International Space Station. 
um, when that Soyuz is docked to the um, the uh, FGB Nader port, it uh, it blocks us from able to do a reboost there. So the plan is again 1.5 meters per second. Um, as far as the uh, the the, US, the orbit vehicle, we have a draft. Uh, request for proposal that went out to industry and we received comments and the plan is to do a final uh, request for proposal in uh, in the next few months uh, as actual, as far as funding for that uh, we have requested funding and uh, we'll be waiting the response uh, we probably won't hear that till uh, later in the year if not early next year and I'll hand it over to Northrop if there's anything they want to add to their part of the question yeah, thanks, Joel. It's, uh, it's Steve. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, throughout the, the the history of the Cygnus evolution, we've made investments, had a real great collaboration space with adding capabilities. Uh, certainly, the reboost capability is kind of a foundational um, capability for uh, deorbit as well. And so, we've been collaborating in that space for a number of years, and look forward to the collaboration uh, in the, for the uh, U.S. deorbit vehicle as it uh, the solicitation comes out. And our next question is from Stephen Clark at Ars Technica. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I think mine uh, is a follow-up from Jeff about the uh, solar array deployment anomaly on NG18. What was the source of that FOD? Uh, I've heard some uh, indication that it could have, could have been from Antares, from something at payload fairing or interstage jettison. Uh, can you just go a little deeper on what uh, caused that was it a launch vehicle issue specifically and uh, also uh, Kurt uh, I think the uh, Antares 330 uh, last year when you unveiled that program you uh, talked about that being available by the uh, end of 2024 now you're seeing summer 2025 just kind of want to get an idea of what caused that slip and do you anticipate having to uh, uh, buy additional uh, launches for Cygnus uh, beyond the three that you have with SpaceX thanks All right, well, that was like three questions in one, Stephen, but um, <clears throat> I'll try to address them. This is Kurt. Um, yeah, back on NG-18, the, uh, the FOD was created by Antares uh, at, at stage separation, and uh, basically we have uh, acoustic blankets that line the interior of our, of our it's called fairing adapter, but it's really like an interstage. And so, so at, at stage separation, we just did that. We had a, it wasn't a clean separation, and we created some debris, and unfortunately, uh, a piece of the acoustic blanket uh, became lodged in one of the Cigna solar arrays. Um, we have uh, we have done a lot of work to understand the cause, um, and we have implemented corrective actions for NG19, and uh, and we've we've brought in some uh, independent looks at it, and and uh, as well as NASA has looked at it in great detail, and everyone agrees we're ready to proceed with the NG19 launch. Um, the uh, yes, the A330. Um, we were hoping for end of 24. You know, the first uh, launch that we intend to use it for is uh, NG23, and that would be in the summer of 25. Um, we we had, uh, as I mentioned, uh, making good progress uh, on the engines and the structures. So we've been through the CDR phase on those, and we've got a, a A330 system level CDR uh, coming up just next month, and we hope to get to, or we plan to get to a, a hot fire on the engines uh, this fall. So. And uh, as, with regard to, uh, to Cirrus 2, um, you know, right now, uh, you know, we've, we've publicly announced that we, that we purchased three Falcon 9 rides. Um, and, uh, and and so we plan NG 2021 20, 22 missions on, on Falcon 9, and then the plan is to return uh, to Wallops for NG 23, 24, 25 with uh, the Antares 330. All right, and now we'll take a question from Ask NASA, and I believe this will be for Heidi Paris. Uh, how do exploration experiments set us up for destinations to come, and what are some of the research that benefits life on Earth? Um, so, so the International Space Station, one of its primary purposes and one of the fantastic things about it is that it is um, a testbed for, for new research and new technologies. Um, it's, 
it's sufficiently close to Earth that it allows us to send up hardware um, and test it out and see how it works. And if it doesn't work, then we're able to send it back and make changes um, that, that ultimately you know, will be useful for future spaceflight exploration. Um, talking about the, uh, some of the experiments on um, this mission that are uh, looking for that uh, technology demonstration, um, I mentioned Sapphire. You know, this is a sixth Sapphire mission, um, which means they've had five previous Sapphire missions, and each one has, you know, has, has taught us a little bit more about how um, fire spreads in spacecrafts um, and how we can you know, more effectively and efficiently stop the spread of, of those fires. Um, the, the five different missions have included materials of different sizes, um, different types of materials, different levels of oxygen concentration, um, and all of this data is um, you know, feeding into um, the, the, the design and the production strategies for future uh, exploration spacecraft. Um, PWD, Exploration PWD was another one that I mentioned. Um, they are, you know, again, testing out those technologies needed for future exploration. Um, and, and really improving their systems with exploration specifically in mind. Some of the challenges that we know are coming up for exploration that we don't necessarily have to face on the ISS. Um, things like um, being able to go into dormancy and avoid water stagnation and biofilm uh, buildup. Um, so this uh, exploration PWD is testing out some new UV sterilization technology um, that will just allow us to, you know, to really be a lot more flexible in the types of operations we can support. Um, and then what was the other part of that question? And how does it benefit life on Earth? Ah, okay. Um, and so, yeah, we have, uh, you know, uh, as I kind of mentioned, all of the research that we do is, is um, directly geared at benefiting life on Earth in some way. Um, and, you know, even the exploration technologies that we're testing are, you know, looking to repurpose those, uh, those technologies for things that benefit our lives on Earth. Um, looking over the list of uh, investigations launching on this flight, um, a couple that I, that I didn't mention, um, we have uh, some biology t uh, investigations, um, one that's looking at uh, things like creation of artificial retinas using um, protein-based photoreceptor cells um, that is difficult to do on Earth because of the sedimentation we see with uh, the force of gravity, but in microgravity, um, those layers are much more um, uh, evenly distributed and can have a much better quality. Um, I mentioned uh, some of our advanced uh, materials research. So, you know, right now, um, semiconductor manufacturing is, is a national priority, um, as, as well as being able to create other advanced materials. And so we do have investigations um, that are looking to see if we can create materials in microgravity that are sufficiently better that they actually may drive a, um, you know, a, a profitable low Earth economy in those areas. Um, so I think those are a few of the examples. Um, a, another great way to, to check on some more examples of how um, uh, the ISS research is benefiting life on Earth, um, we put out uh, something called a Benefits for Humanity book, um, and that's available online at nasa.gov uh, forward slash station benefits. Thank you. And as a reminder to media, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 to enter the queue. Our next question will be from Micah Vandenberg at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Steve or Kurt, um, does, does using the three Falcon 9 launches for uh, NG20, 21, and 22 sort of make those flights relatively less profitable for Northrop? And do you, do you feel some pressure to get, you know, A330 going because of that and also because those flights, you know, will be handled by a company you also compete with? Thanks. Yeah, Steve, I'll start and maybe uh, have Kurt chime in. Uh, yeah, we, we certainly, uh, the first and foremost, uh, you know, um, mission goal we have is to support the needs of the space station and the astronauts. So certainly uh, when we have to pivot to a new launch vehicle based on a, a development we have going in-house, we're, we're more than happy to do that. And we, we collaborate, collaborate with our competitive mates all the time and certainly do that with SpaceX here. You know, I would say from a profitability perspective, I won't go into details, but I think it was a, it was a great deal for both sides, and I, I wouldn't see any adverse impacts from from doing that launch. Uh, certainly, we had to do some development on the fairing and some uh, you know science development facility work, but I would say that it was all very favorably handled in the, in the collaboration space. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that. Yeah, this is Kurt. I'll just I'll just add, um, you know that that. Uh, 
you know, we, we plan to fly the 230 plus through, you know, you know, for more missions. Uh, you know, the war in Ukraine, ha, you know, put put our supply chain um, at risk, and so you know, we made the decision here, as as Steve said, you know, to prioritize, you know, keeping the cargo going to the space station. That's number one for Northrop Grumman, and we understand that absolutely. Uh, we're excited that the that 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 we're investing in a new space launch vehicle here. You know, the Antares 330 is the first step um, to, you know, to bring in a domestic supply chain. Uh, we think that that also opens doors uh, for other markets for us. Um, you know, we think, uh, so the A330 is the first thing we're gonna do to launch cargo, um, but that's gonna, <clears throat> this first stage is gonna be bigger. Uh, it's gonna provide about 25% increase in mass to orbit uh, for Cygnus, and so that'll that'll increase the amount of cargo that they can carry. Um, so we're going to go from around 8,100 kilograms mass to orbit up to 10,500 with the Antares 330. And then uh, after the A330 starts flying, we're going to replace the second stage and create the the new medium launch vehicle, and that's going to going to really crank up the capability to around 16,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. So that's a doubling of the of the capability of the rocket that we're currently flying. So so that increased capability, coupled with the domestic supply chain, uh, we think we're going to be able to address other markets, including uh, NASA civil um, and uh, DOD markets, as well as commercial, in addition to the, to the cargo resupply that, that we hope to continue to do. And our next question is from Jim Siegel at nasatech.com. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, a question for Heidi. Uh, I'm particularly interested when I do my writing for my um, readers uh, about uh, talking about the benefits that uh, they will accrue, the people on Earth will accrue from all the missions that have been done and investigations on board the International Space Station. And particularly, I was interested in your comment about, um, about the Retina uh, project. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about exactly uh, what's going to happen in that experiment. Uh, are they going to be making retinas? Will they be uh, brought back to Earth? Will they be inserted into human beings? That sort of thing. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so the, the investigation name is Protein-Based Artificial Retina Manufacturing. And this is actually, I believe it's their eighth flight. Um, so they've had a number of, of different opportunities to really refine um, and, and you know, perfect their technology. I think right around the maybe fourth or fifth uh, flight that they had, they were able to get a, um, a, a artificial retina that was 200 layers uh, thick, which was their goal. Um, and, and uh, showed a lot of uniformity. Um, so, but they're continuing to, you know, refine and, and tweak that process um, to see what, what works and what doesn't um, and, and what they can do to improve. Um, so this is, to my understanding, that, you know, we're kind of in the early stages, right? So anything that they make in microgravity will go through a lot of testing on the ground. Um, nothing is, is slated to go in a, in a human eye quite yet, but this is a part of the process where they're using the ISS to learn, um, you know, what they need to do to make better products that can one day be uh, be translated into uh, patients with retinal degenerative diseases. And and what uh, hardware is going to be used on the ISS to perform these uh, investigations for this one? Um, this is, yeah, this is actually um, it's integrated by a company called uh, Space Tango. Um, the entire investigation is contained in one of their uh, cube labs that is um, installed into a payload card and in, into the Tango Lab facility on ISS. Thank you. All right, and our next question will comes from Ask NASA, and it's what's the freshest product that can be brought up on a cargo mission to the space station? I think it'll be back to Heidi. Product like produce, could you see any fresh food? Um, and so uh, I'll help out and take that one. So we are bringing um, fresh fruit up to the International Space Station. So uh, grapefruits, apples, oranges, cherry tomatoes, blueberries. Um, we're also delivering on this vehicle, since I have the four, just a couple other things, a, uh, a pizza uh, kit that uh, is a very uh, favorite of the crew members. 
We have some, um, some a cheese kit going up, which is also favorite, and we have ice cream going up. So a number of items for the crew. Um, a well-fed crew is a happy crew. And our next question comes from Marcia Smith at Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks for letting me ask another one. This is to Joel and Heidi. Uh, is anything special planned for the uh, attendees at the ISSRDC conference? Are they going to be talking with the astronauts up on the space station? And do you know if any of the researchers who have experiments on this bigness are going to be at the conference and talking about their experiments? Yeah, so at every conference we have a crew message, and so the crew has done a, a recorded message that will be given to all the participants at the conference. And uh, we will have participation uh, from some of the, uh, the developers that are flying on Cygnus as well as, uh, as they fly on the other vehicles. And the conference is also available for virtual participants. And so if uh, you can't make it to Seattle, there is an opportunity to uh, dial in and participate virtually. All right, and our next question in the queue is from Stephen Clark at Ars Technica. Hi, thanks for taking another question. I think this one's for Kurt as well. Uh, wanted to ask if there are any, for this launch, for this last Antares 230 Plus, are there any uh, Russian or Ukrainian engineers or technicians uh, that you need expertise from uh, during any of these uh, launch preparations or during the countdown either on site or remotely uh, for this mission or uh, do you not anticipate connecting uh, with Yuzhnoya, Yuzhmash or Energomash during uh, the final few days or actually through any point of the launch campaign if you had to lean on them in any way. Thanks. Yeah, yep, I understand. Uh, yeah, this is Kurt. So, um so I'll start with our Ukrainian partners first. They've, uh, we've had a number of, uh, of personnel here on site uh, at Wallops, and uh, and they provided their usual support um, over the past uh, year, and um, and are in their usual roles here for NG19. So they they man uh, several consoles for us and are looking at data from the Stage One systems um, that they have design cognizance for. Um, they're really advising us. They don't actually operate any of the, the hardware. You know, all of uh, Northrop Grumman employees uh, control the rocket and get it into the right configuration and so on and so But it's really great to have our Ukrainian partners here, you know, advising us and, and providing that design expertise. Um, let's see, for Energomash, uh, they have continued to support remotely. Uh, on NG18, we, we had a remote support uh, model that worked very well, and so we're going to employ that again on NG19. So we will have them uh, looking at data uh, in Russia, and uh, they'll be connected to the voice nets and uh, providing that design cognizance. And really, it's mainly for you know off nominal situations, uh, questions about data that might look uh, look out of the ordinary. That it's helpful to have them have their advice for. Uh, we have been having uh, uh, weekly technical telecons with their team. As usual, and uh, you know they've been, you know, monitoring um, the operations that we do with the engines as as we've done uh, since roughly 2015. So, so we've been able to continue that support. We appreciate that they, um, you know, are supportive of the International Space Station program, and that they see the the benefit to continue to providing that support and and getting these missions launched uh, for the benefit of the entire ISS partnership. And we have another question from Jim Siegel at nastatech.com. Oh, thank you for taking my uh, second question. Uh, just as a follow-up, Heidi, um, are there any other uh, investigations on this flight uh, that have a particular relevance to uh, to people uh, here on Earth? And can you describe a, a couple of those maybe in some detail? Thank you. Sure. Um, looking at the, the list of things launching on this flight, um, one of the items um, that I, I sort of mentioned in my opening but didn't go into detail is an investigation called SUBSA Microgravity Graphene Aerogels, or UGGA. Um, and it's looking at potentially being able to, um, to create 
um, better uh, graphene aerogels, which are materials that are ultra light, very porous, um, but have all the amazing characteristics of graphene, like superconductivity um, uh, and, uh, and great electrical properties. Um, and so being able to understand, um, you know, how to create better materials can be very useful in applications on Earth, um, including in especially battery storage, um, things like supercapacitors, um, and, and uh, other applications um, that, that we could foresee uh, on Earth. Um, another one launching on this flight, um, this is actually some pre-positioning hardware um, for an investigation called BFF Cardiac. Um, BFF is the biofabrication facility, and it's looking um, at kind of the first step to being able to print um, human uh, cells and tissues and organs that may one day be able to be transplanted into patients um, that, that need, you know, an organ transplant. And again, similar to with the, with the protein-based artificial retina, um, you know, this is in the early stages, um, but, but recognizing how, um, how deep the shortage is on, on organs needed for transplant on Earth, um, the potential that this may one day be able to, um, to help fill that gap is, uh, is very exciting. Thanks, Heidi. And that is our final question for today. Thank you to all of our briefers uh, for the opening comments and the questions, and thank you to the media that joined today's call and for those listening on nasa.gov slash live. Again, launch is targeting 8.31 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Tuesday, August 1st. Our live launch coverage on NASA TV, the NASA app, and the agency's website will begin at 8 p.m. Thank you, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you for your participation in today's conference.